but he was just look an exceptional footballer and I was very lucky to play with him. The way, the, the way he said it was, what I want you to do is I don't give a fiddlers about the National League, he said, but have them ready for the championship for me. So you work on everything below the neck. And when you have them right for me, then I'll work on everything above the neck. <laughs> Being stuck in football, I've never seen anybody take, and they'd see the funny side of mm. Paul, you know, I've never seen anybody take football as serious as, as he yeah. took. And then he explained that what this means is when you are hitting a Westmead man the next day in Croke Park, it's like hitting your fist off an oak tree. It bounces off you. You're so strong now, you're physically fit. And he put that belief into their head, and they felt that they were way stronger already. He was dead, he was a desperate rogue. I don't know why I, I'm thinking of Mark here. He, he was the uncle that, he was like a brother more than an uncle in that. You know, if we were doing something wrong, he'd join us more than tell us to stop. <laughs> Look, I don't think, I think uh, the mould was broken when they, when they made party, yeah. and I don't think there'll be ever anybody like no. him again. Yeah. Ten years ago, on the 15th of December 2012, Paddy O'Shea died suddenly at his home in Ardebo or West Kerry. He was just 57 years of age. Paddy O'Shea is an iconic figure in the history of Gaelic football. His record as a player is incredible. He played 53 uninterrupted championship matches for Kerry and 84 league matches between 1974 and 1988. During that time, he won a joint record eight All-Ireland Senior Football medals. 11 Munster Senior Football Medals, 4 National League Medals and 5 All-Star Awards. In 10 All-Ireland Final Appearances, he conceded just one goal and one point to a direct opponent. Then, as manager of Kerry, he won 6 Munster Finals, 2 All-Ireland Titles and 1 National League. He also managed Westmead to the only Leinster Senior Football Championship in the county's history. However, to reduce the story of Paddy O'Shea to a roll call of his victories, is obviously totally inadequate. He was a singular man, one of whom it can truly be said they broke the mould after he was made. My name is Paul Rouse and I'm here at the South County Bar in Douglas for this special edition of the Irish Examiner Gaelic Football Show. I'm joined here by the former Kerry footballer Tomás O'Shea, who is Paddy's nephew, by Paddy's long-term friend, fellow Gaeltacht and West Kerry clubmate Tomás O'Flaherty, and by his illustrious former teammate Mikey Sheehy, with whom he shared so much success in a Kerry jersey. Mikey, I'm, I'm going to start with you. How would you describe Paddy as a footballer? Well, I suppose a lot of the stuff that you've said there, Paul, uh, describes him. I think the one statistic that sticks out is uh, what he conceded as a defender in all those All Ireland finals. You know, an incredible player. And like Paddy was my man, his nephew here alongside me, was a great man to saunter up the field and kick scores. But if you check Paddy's record, he was an incredible man to, to, to bomb forward and score. And I, another thing I would say about him is that, you know, being with him, um, it's it is very hard to put a word on it, you know, but he, he's, he's, he was obviously an inspirational individual. Even though he was about nine months younger than me, I actually always looked up to him, you know, because I came across him years ago. The first time I ever came across him was when we played the SEM. Uh, and he, he, I was playing with Tralee CBS and we never beat the same body. was always one of, one of the men that did fierce damage to us. But even, even at that age, you could see that he was going to be uh, a serious, serious operator. Also played Kerry Minor football with him and under 21. And um, I suppose I was probably, myself and himself, were the first two of, we'll say, Pat Spillane, Ogie Moore and Bomber and all those lads to get on the, the Kerry senior panel. The two of us played together in... Um, National League final in 1974 against Roscommon and uh, it was funny, um, the two of us were rooming together and in those days <coughs> we were staying in the Skyland Hotel on the Saturday night, there was no team meeting or nothing, you know, you could do what you wanted to do. Dangerous enough just, just a nice little story about Paddy was it, like I was the Tony and he was, you know, the, the Westie like, but the role should have been reversed really because he was far sharper than me. So. We were kind of killing time on the Saturday night anyway. It was a beautiful April evening, I remember. And uh, 
we, he said, we'll go away for a walk. So we, we walked up to Whitehall, up towards Home Farm, and there was a soccer match on. I know Paddy would have no interest in soccer, but just to give them, he said, yeah, we'll go in and watch it to some D.O. Larry Cup final or something that was on. So we spent about a half an hour inside and were bored, and this is about 8 o'clock, half 8, and we wandered back down there towards the skyline. He says to me, like, and I wasn't, I was hardly taking a, a drink at all at the time. I was only, he was 19, I was 20. And he was far more seasoned at that than me at that stage. So he says to me, will we go for a pint? And I was kind of saying, Jeannie Mac, I don't know about <laughs> it. So we ended up in the cat and cage anyway. And uh, my sum total of drink anyway, it used to always be a, a pint of Smittix maybe with a good shot of lemonade. But that's all I was ill for. So next thing we went in and, uh, and I, he didn't even let me call. What? We looked two pints a half there. He said to the barman, we had at least four, if not five. Anyway, this is the night before National League final. And I remember going up to the room, like, and I was, you know, and, you know, nice, nice, happy. You're sure it made no difference to your man. And the following day, you know, we we got on okay. We actually drew the game. I won the replay. But he was, he was, he was just such a, such a, a warm character, is what I call him as well, you know. And he was, as the boys will tell you, he was, um, he was very roguish as well. But he had this thing in the dressing room as well, Paul. You know, I know I'm going off script a little bit with him, but. He, he was just inspirational. He was a leader. You know, Michal Amar Hertig said he uh, epitomised the Kerry spirit in how he played football. Yeah, probably a, a good, 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 good description of him. You know, but he was like his his all round skill level was 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 quite exceptional as well. You know. So you played the same side of the field as him most of. I did. Most of right, most right, of full, so and he was up right half back. Yeah. So there must have been an understanding in terms of. Timing of runs in terms of getting delivery of passes. Oh, there would there would be, and like I mean, that came from training, you know, from hours of playing backs and forwards and whatever, and and matches, AVB games. You would, and it is a thing that the chemistry kind of, I think, it comes together. You know, you don't you don't even have to to plan and talk to a guy before a game. You know what run he's going to make. He'd know what run I was going to make, or if you weren't making it, he'd give you, he'd let you know that you weren't making it, you know. But but he was just, you know, and another thing about him is that, you know, people would probably realise, like, what he was like, he was, I know, he worked as a guard for a number of years and he did different things, but he was like a professional footballer, you know. And, you know, he was often one of the fellas, and I was often in there myself, the fatties, as, as Mikko used to call us, you know, during, we'd say, early on in the championship when fellas weren't going well and he reckoned he'd have to call in a certain number of parties. He was nearly always called in, but I really and truly couldn't understand why he was called in because he was always in, in peak condition. And he was a fella that really didn't put on, I never saw him getting get, getting majorly overweight, you know, but I suppose Mikko knew that he was dipping the head into the bucket the other time. And I think party actually would enjoy to be to be to be called in in in, in, in that uh, bracket but he was just look an exceptional footballer and i was very lucky to play with him tomas of you you saw him play when you were young as well from the very beginning you saw him play underage football yeah well, i suppose the talk in the golf at the time i was only nine years of age <clears throat> and the talk of the golf that there was a young lad coming through and uh, my first time seeing him was inside in Dingle. I got the CA bus into Dingle when I was nine years of age and one Saturday evening. And what I remember of him that evening was he was playing cornerback, 14 years of age, senior football, and he had the white collar. Well, the well, had red and white jerseys that time, and he had the white collar up. And then five years, six years later, I was playing on the well team with him, and uh, he was off playing with Kerry then, but on Saturday evenings, before uh, a championship game, you know, a Munster championship game or a Munster final, he'd uh, he'd asked me to go into Dingle with him, basically to kick the ball to him for about 20 minutes. So that went on for a number of years. And then I played with him, with West Kerry, and then I played under him when he was manager of Kerry, or West Kerry. And then I ended up in Westmead with him later on again. So, yeah, he was, I was, he was there for a good bit of, whatever I did in football. And, and Tomas O'Shea, you, did you model your how you played on Paddy, or was it something that was just, it was, in the, it was in the air rather than something that was conscious? I don't think so, no. I was never told to play whatever way. I think um, I started out as a forward, would you believe? And it was in first year in secondary school that I, I went up to the teacher and I asked, could I be swapped into the backs with another fellow who was playing wing back who wanted to go up corner forward so we swapped so no there was never there was never a kind of um, 
uh, comparison made. You know, I think Paddy was very traditional in his own beliefs in the way the game should be played. You know, I think he loved going forward himself. Uh, but if I went forward three or four times in the game, he wouldn't be shy and telling me, stay back, you have no business up there. There's fellas up there that'll do it. You wouldn't answer him back. You'd like to have answered him back. But um, no, he, he, he was very traditionalist in the way, he, the way he prepared teams, the way he wanted players to line out. Do you know, there was never tactics with him didn't go. If you were number five, you weren't switched over to, to I think there was a big difference when Jack Connor came in. He would switch defenders around to suit forwards. But I think, and it came from... The, the great carry team that you line out the way you line out and that's it and you pick up who comes your way and that's it and you sort them out um, um, so yeah there was no there was no play like party or, or whatever I didn't you see outside of the footage the lads would have played with him and played I, I never saw him play you towards the very him. end yeah. yeah I did towards the very end just as he was about trying to get back onto the Kerry team around 80, 88, 89 that time when oh, he yeah. retired there was a big game inside in, uh, Dingle where there was an infamous clash himself and Dennis Higgins mm. uh, where Paddy came out and uh, the two of them split themselves up and they, I could hear the crack I actually missed the, the actual incident but I heard the crack and I went into both restrooms, there was blood everywhere, but that was the end of it for him because I'd say after that he kind of, you know, he was at an age where he, he, he knew he should have, he had to pack it in really, you know, but um, no, yeah, I did. Yeah, I was actually playing in that game. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and he was saying, what else could I do? You know, he had to, he had to crash into so the So what happened? So they ran was, into each so other. So the rest of were up a few points. It was a West Kerry League final. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Paddy was playing fullback, marking Liam Higgins, a great friend of his. And there was nobody on this side of midfield. The ball broke loose. Dennis Higgins was going for the ball. Paddy decided, I have to get that ball, otherwise they have the game won. So he went and the two of them head on 50 miles an hour yeah. and they clashed. Paddy had to get, I think, 35 stitches in the year or something afterwards. Um, but after that... Oh, see, go well. <laughs> but, but after that, um, he, I think he, he found it very difficult to go in for a 50-50 ball with anybody. And it was shortly afterwards that he, he gave it up. But just going back before that, I went to the SEM for one year, around 1973. Mm. And Mikey, you might remember this. Mm. I don't know, they have some way in Kerry of identifying young lads coming through. But the talk in the SEM at the time was, who now would be Kerry future stars? And there was three guys that lads in the SEM used to talk about. Pat Spillane, who was no longer in the SEM at this stage, Paddy Shea, and Sean Walsh. They were the college yeah. stars yeah. at the time. Yeah. And sure, look, they were right, you know. It came true, in fairness. Yeah, they did, yeah. That, that, it's interesting that a clash, so that clash kind of probably finished them to some extent in that career. But, it, but I, I saw an interview from 1980. Um, it was an Irish language really brilliantly shot Irish language documentary from 1980 where Paulie was asked in Irish was he was he dirty uh, as a footballer and he, he he had a great answer for it and he said everything anything I do I do it when the football is around around me I wouldn't have the heart to do something if the ball wasn't around mm -hmm. and he kind of re rejected that idea but, but there's a clip on YouTube of himself and Dinny Allen mm -hmm. having um, I suppose exchanging um, gestures uh, punches, yeah, yeah. well, an elbow and a punch <laughs> yeah. from '75, and it kind of gives. It, it doesn't seem to me to be a fair image of but how he played. I, I, I don't think so at all. And uh, I suppose when Paddy was managing teams, what he'd say to lads is he had no time for this trash talk. He said, if you answer back or if you say something to fellas, you're letting them poke at you, and now you're getting weaker. So say nothing, go in for a heavy clash or whatever, but say nothing shake their hand at the beginning of the game, say nothing, and be as tough as you can be in the game mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. And he played it tough, but he wasn't, I don't think he was dirty. I know that he hit Dini Allen that time, and um, it's, it's, it's yeah, on you, YouTube. And No, but you're spot on, because I marked him a good few times. Now, all I will say, three or four times in county championship games, um, I was centre forward, usually with Stax and Paddy was centre back with West Kerry. <clears throat> Never got a dirty blow from him. No, it was... Game was on when you had the ball, like you know, and he he was tough. But now, nah, never, never, never got a false blow off him. 
got a good few false blows off a couple of other Kerry Phillips. How would he be inside be. In, uh, in Killarney, Mark oh, and Pat Oh, he'd be, he'd, be, he'd be tough, but he'd do exactly in training what he'd do in a game. And I can remember one, one story, actually, I think it was, I think it was before the 1980 All-Ireland Final against Ross Common. Mick Dwyer, we used to always go for a kick around on the Saturday morning and then go for a bit of grub and then down to Mickey Docks and onto the train. And Mick would never, all you do was kick around, but this time Mick got a bit of a rush of blood to the head and he said, we'll play 10 minutes of backs and forwards. And everything was kind of going nice and cagey, fellas were, well, there was no physicality. Mick did emphasize, look, don't do anything. Next thing a ball broke between party. And Spillane broke on the ground. And Spillane went down for it. Well, if he did, my man came in anyway. And he drew. Paddy was just in the zone. Yeah. Drew on the ball. Next thing, all hell broke loose. Spillane, of course, being Spillane, he, he made a meal of it and was rolling around. And somebody said to Paddy after and said, the no, gee, you're back in. Paddy was saying, look, I'm in the zone. If that happens tomorrow, he said, am I going to stand back and let your man pick up the ball? I'm not. You know, so he was in the zone. So. He, play, he, play, he trained the way he played. Yeah, he absolutely he did. Yeah. Where where did this come from, Tomas? This this approach to the game, like he obviously, he, he, Mikey said earlier, but he was almost a full time footballer after leaving the guards, and possibly even when he was with the guards, he he probably did a fair bit of training <laughs> and, and, and on during work hours. But um, where did this obsession with football come from? I don't know. He always had a fierce interest in the history of Kerry football and the old footballers and the old stories and the footballers of North Kerry and South Kerry and Paddy Bond inside and Dingley. He had a great growth for that. He had a first cousin over the road, Tom Long. And um, like my dad and Tom played football and Tom won an All Ireland minor medal with, with Kerry. But they didn't have the drive or the focus or the attention or I suppose the selfishness that Paddy had. He was very driven in what he wanted. And from an early age, I think, when he went to school, it was all football. He went to the same. Um, Tom went to Dingle. My dad went to the same. But it wasn't, he didn't go to the same to learn. He went to the same because he knew the same was the nursery of football in Kerry, and he wanted to go there. Uh, I think he was kicked out mm. of the same as well. I think he was. <laughs> he was kicked out of the same for reading dirty magazines. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, but he, then he, he, when he went into... Um, I suppose we saw him at home and I remember seeing the likes of because those lads were all heroes to us and he just took it, he went into the guards after and that didn't suit him, he wanted to be at home, he was always home even in later years, even if it was up the country on a late night, out or whatever, you'd have a driver with him and he right, always, yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> but he'd land home in his own bed, he wanted to be at home so he was a home bird um, but then you'd see the type of training he did and I think you don't learn something by it being written down. You, you learn better, I think, if you see it being done. And the way he trained, because I didn't understand it at the time. It was summertime. You'd know it was summertime. We were off school, and the boys would be training inside on a Tuesday and a Thursday. But on a Monday and a Wednesday, he had a routine. And uh, Mikey was right. He was ahead of his time. He didn't mm. care about work, so he'd get his sleep during the day. He would time it. Um, but on those days off, and uh, the, the Miko trainings were, were legendary, apparently, how tough they were. How do you describe them as sadistic? Yeah, uh, well, Mikey be, Mikey be the man to tell you, but he would, <laughs> on the day kids. off, yeah. he'd jog around Slay Head, yeah. which is about 13 miles, but he wouldn't go on the road. He'd go up to the top of the Klesach, over the top of the mountain, down into the graveyard, and around Slay Head, and we did a job then of, of these hurls. They'd be about 10 hurls, and we'd bring them down the beach, and he'd set them up, and they'd be that high, and he'd jump them uh, five in a row, and he'd go round and round, he'd jump into the tide, and back <clears> up to the house. But everything, like Mikey said, he enjoyed the crack and all that, but I've yeah. never, and we've all yeah. been stuck yeah. in football, I've never seen anybody take, and they'd see the funny side of party mm. and all that, never seen anybody take football as serious as, as he you, took. You used yeah. a very interesting word there in the middle of that. You said he was selfish. Yeah. What do you mean by that? I mean, he put football ahead of everything, everything like work and family even, and, and you see that then. And it mightn't be healthy, you know, it, it's a selfishness that puts everything. Like he would work, there was days I'd see, like I used to work inside in the bar, you know, you'd go into the bar and he'd say, back in 10 minutes there, I'd be gone for three and a half hours, but it was take it easy somewhere. He, he, was, he was just selfish. Everything was worked around football mm. and that was it. So if, if work was coming in the way, packing the guards, came home, 
took a, took a lease on Cruisers, Cruisers yeah. uh, came across and then built his own place. He wanted his own place. He wanted it on the main road, um, but everything was was. You know, I remember he he'd, he'd have the car. I'd say the whatever the car be ready early, and they'd go over. He was always a great man to be inside and training early as a manager. I only saw him, but as a player, everything was oh, geared been, yeah. towards yeah. Kerry. That was it. Yeah. Nothing. And that's the selfishness yeah. that I that I'm on about. Like, Do you know, I you'd expect Kerry. that out of you then. Yeah. Do you know, if you were playing and he was manager for us, we couldn't get away with it. When he actually left and Jack got in, we got away with a lot more because we could go for a couple of jars back west or whatever. But when he was there, if you saw the car going in late at night, you have no business doing this or that, football number one, you know. So that was it. And it was over years and years you'd see it. Was he, was he, would you, would you put him as the most driven member of, of your famous team? Well, he would have certainly been one of the one of the most, Paul. Yeah, absolutely, totally. But you know, Tomas, it's a good point in being selfish. Like I think that was one of the one of the, the things that Mick O'Dwyer demanded of most people, and Paddy certainly was 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 always doing that. But another thing about him was, <clears throat> like I've listened to loads of people down through the years in dressing rooms. You know, probably the best man I've ever listened to would have been Mick, obviously. But next best would have been Paddy. In you know, way. just to, just the way he spoke. You Even know, when he was a player, or as a player, you know, he spoke like, and he he, you know, you always, you know, he always spoke sense. Uh, he always wanted the betterment of the t of the team. But no matter what players were doing, you know, if Paddy s stood up and said a few words, everybody gave their attention to him straight away. And not not a lot of people can do that, you know. But he he was he was just a a, a brilliant guy. Did it come from home? From him, this, this, the the drive and the football being number one, did it come from 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 the house he grew up in? I don't know. I I, I don't think there was a huge tradition of football in the immediate family. My grandmother was was Lavin, uh, Beatrice Lavin from from Sligo, and my grandfather Tommy came from the O'Shea's and Cara Trent, and there wasn't a huge tradition of football there. There was a, a bit of football in. Um, over the road in, in terms of his first cousin, Tom Long, had won all Ireland with Mick O'Connell and Dwyer and all them. But I think it just came because football is the number one sport in West Kerry and there is nothing else and there was nothing there at that time. And he was, uh, my dad and and Tom were born over in London, so he would have he would have grown up. He was, he was brought home and he, there was a big age gap between them. But he was just reared. Uh, fully locally and it was just there was a draw for Kerry football I think that tradition had, had started from day one in the 20s with Kerry when they won the first four in a row there was just a tradition in Kerry and he was mad for that he was just one of these he wanted uh, to be a county he just footballer. wanted to be mm. above anything else and like it's not like everybody be talking it's not when I say that he was I think everybody has to be selfish and that mm. great Kerry yeah. team were you know they were all driven they had to be to be as successful as they were dwyer had to be driven and i'm sure dwyer and, and mikey were, they were all selfish like but Absolutely. from our point of view we saw what we saw was just pure like those days that he used to train on the days off i remember seeing you'd see tommy Doyle used to come back a good bit with him i'd say he was mad enough to do the training but um it was phenomenal like there was there was and then the banter side of it he just had a great balance it's, when it's, he was supposed to train he trained and i think maybe I don't know, he had it right, like, and he had it right for the teams. I remember just thinking there as you were talking, when, when he was manager, he used to get on famously with the players, but he would demand the same that he would do himself on the field. But on the off-season, I remember he came up, we were in college in Limerick, and he drove up one night, he brought us all out in the town, brought us for dinner, brought us for, for a few pints, and then as we were going for the nightclub, put a few bob in our pocket, and then headed off himself, left us off. But he was doing that everywhere. He'd make touch with, with parents. He had that extra touch, and I think that used to make it a huge difference to, to, to young lads. They'd go the extra yard for him, you know, and he had a relationship with them in the dressing room. But when it came to football, then it was cutthroat, and that's the way everybody knew it was with him. Like. The, I suppose the other thing, uh, you know, an example of that drive, that how ambitious he was for Kerry football. He had, I think he had won five All Islands at this stage. So he had made the Kerry team, he had won five All-Irelands. So his next thinking then was he wanted to captain Kerry. So for him to captain Kerry, he'd have to win a county championship. And he was playing with West Kerry, who hadn't won a county championship since 1948. And they couldn't, there was five clubs, they couldn't get things right. 
So what did he do? He decided he'd ma he was still playing with Kerry. He said he'd manage West Kerry, and they won the county championship. So that's right, he was yeah. captain of Kerry. Mm. That's how determined he was. And did the club mean as much to him as the county? I don't think so, really. No, I don't think so. Like green and gold was everything to him. Mm. Everything green and gold. We're going out with Kerry up in Crow Park, bringing back Sam McGuire to Kerry. That was his main, main thing always. And everything was geared towards that, as Thomas would say. Like, I just remember coming home on the bus from school in Dingle around Slayhead once in January, and he'd be running around Slayhead at that time against the wind, up against the yeah, Atlantic. Absolutely. And that was him preparing for summer months in Parky Reeve or Killarney. Um, so like, he was well prepared for it all. Uh, it's very interesting that space between when he finished playing and then became a manager and what he did to become a manager and he clearly wanted the Kerry job almost immediately after finishing playing but he did the 21s and then managed uh, West Kerry went back to West Kerry won another championship with West Kerry and ended up being there he, it's very difficult to see him settling for anything other than managing Kerry yeah I suppose it, it, they probably didn't trust him you know he was they thought he was a bit wild, maybe, and that he wasn't able to. <laughs> was that to, unfair? Uh, I, uh, of course it was. Yeah, for us, uh, you know, that knew him, it was because I knew I was in the dressing with the room with mm -hmm. him. You were in the dressing room with him. You know what he was like, Absolutely. that he was able to manage players and that he was able mm -hmm. to get results out of players. But eventually, they did, um, they did give him the under-21 job uh, with James McAllard, and they won in All-Ireland. And I think it was the following year, then 1996, that he managed Kerry for the first time, and they won a, a monster final I, straight away. Yeah, I think I think um, the first time he went for the under 21 job, did he, did he he didn't get it? Was it would I be right or wrong? On that? He went for Which it was, once or twice. Oh, he did. Yeah, he did. He did. But you know something, Paul? Another issue with him that you talk about his determination. You know, and like, I mean, he always wanted to have his own bar. As Tomasa said back back west, like, and there was a lot of objections to him for for a number of years or whatever length of time he was trying, but he eventually got there, and then he progressed with which I think his legacy is huge with this tournament that he ran. I mean, Paddy was a very smart guy. He was, you know, as I said to you before in football terms, he was ahead of his time. He was the same as a businessman. You know, he was smart. Look at the money that that his tournament generates back in West Kerry and. Even it, some of it, it even comes into Chile now with accommodation or whatever. It's a huge tournament, and there's teams coming from every part of the country and outside the country, and you know that's that's a huge credit to him. There, there was an interview with him after he took up in Cruisers, and he took the lease there, and he basically said he was sick working for anybody else. He wanted to work for himself. That he was now his own boss, and he kind of said into that independence of spirit. Do you think? Do you think he was a loner? I don't know. I I, I think he was. Um, so gregarious, it kind of sounds like yeah, a stupid I question think, in a way. But. I remember um, his wife Mara said that he was uh, naturally shy, but in his own, he didn't come across as that, you know. Yes. And as later years went on, he got more confidence, and I think the sport itself brought out confidence in him. But um, no, I don't think he was a loner. I think he had a certain vision in front of him, and when he got stuck into something, he would go at it 110% until it succeeded, and more often than not, it would. Um, and I, I'd agree with what the lad said there, you know, in terms of the way he was perceived as being a wild man from the West with no kind of control, or, or, or that was that was very far from the truth. Like there was was never, that an act? It wasn't. I don't think it was an act. I think his passion came out in different ways, but inside in the dressing room, he wasn't throwing things off the walls, yeah. or he wasn't anything no. like that. He was just knew what buttons to press, when to press, and he got the most out of fellas. And fellas, when I say fellas, would go through the wall for him and bring out passion. It wasn't through roaring. It was through the relationships that he had. He had great relationships with people, and I think that was his biggest strength: was was dealing with people and talking with people and coming around with people. Like you know, he was. He was then he was a desperate rogue. I don't know why I, I, I'm thinking of Mark here. He, he was the uncle that, he was like a brother more than an uncle in that, you know, if we were doing something wrong, he'd join us more than tell us to stop. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So when we were 14 or 15, he'd throw the keys of the car, his own car. He used to always have a big, powerful Nissan, and he'd throw the car 
it's keys to the car trust and he can let us take it off yeah. down the beach on our own but <laughs> he gave it to Mark one evening <laughs> and Mark tore off down the road and Mark missed the corner and drove the car straight over the ditch into the bog and he came back up and he wasn't really afraid of telling Paul he was afraid of my parents reaction but Paddy said, that's fine, we'll get it sorted. And he made a phone call and they got it taken out and they got it fixed up. But Paddy actually, Mark was, I'd say, about 15 at the mm. time. Paddy blackmailed him for four months to work <laughs> behind the bar. <laughs> so, they had to be a favourite. Paddy yeah. saw the opportunity. <laughs> and in the end, one day, Mark, he says, Mark, come on over to the bar, it's time to go work. No, I know I'm not going over. He says, come on now, Mark, come on. I don't care, I've told him, Paddy. He says, I told my parents what happened. He says, you wouldn't get lost. <laughs> <laughs> but he used to, have, uh, he was on that level. He re I remember the pubs would be flat out and we used to watch old matches on the video and um, the Kerry Golden years we used to have on repeat and he'd love coming back and we only had one video in the room or in the house and it was inside my mother's room so we'd all be up in the bed yeah. and he'd come back and he'd have a bit of crack but he'd throw on the matches and he'd be telling stories throughout the the thing, but he'd do anything by our work. It was working the bed, sleep on the floor, like he'd be around the place. His work was walking around the bar, but like he'd have us inside the bar, he'd have everybody else bar himself inside the bar, like but he'd be on the on the right side talking to fellas. So yeah. So he was he was well he was a great businessman then in that respect. <laughs> or was he? Well, if he put his mind to it, like do you know, I always say you saw his kind of. When he actually died, I personally, I do think that he was always chasing something. You know, he was chasing football, he was chasing management, and he was chasing success and Kerry, and then he went after it with Westmeat, and he was always chasing. He was still going up to Clare, and mm -hmm. I think he had actually, in the end, he was focused the last few months before he died. He was focused on work. He was away calmer, and he was actually looking forward to, to his own family, and he wasn't chasing he wasn't chasing a job. He wasn't chasing some other team, and then he died. Like, but it was it was funny enough. The last few few months of it, like you know, he was focused on the tournament, but I think he was always chasing. He always wanted to be in the thick that of it. Like, energy. Mm. yeah, yeah, he always wanted to be in the thick of it. Like he did. Mm. Mm. We, all, we all have egos, but he had a fairly big ego as well. Like he loved the old crack. He loved the banter. He loved the. The, no, you know, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed being in the middle of it. He enjoyed the, <laughs> the, the crack of it, you know. The, his time as manager of Kerry was it's singular for the way it went, but it's also singular for the way it's, it ended. So we'll come to the way it ended in mm -hmm. time, but he was a success by any stretch of the imagination. He won, took a team that hadn't won on All Ireland for more than a decade, won That's two right, All yeah. Irelands, years, yeah. won a few Munsters, won a National League. Yeah. Is that how you would look at it? Ab absolutely. You know, again, it was because of his determination and the way he was driven. Like, Kerry hadn't won All Ireland for <clears throat> 11 years. And, like, that's, that's I don't want to mean sound <laughs> big headed about that, like, but that's that's a long time in Kerry. And it was a pressure job, but he, you know, he faced it. He, he, he loved the challenge. And uh, he brought the boys on, and uh, he was involved in, in 96. They were beaten in the All Ireland semi final by Mayo. But the following year, ninety-seven, um, it was you know, t you know, it was a it was a tough battle, but th they got over the line, and um, you know, I I, th I think they were always going to win with him because he was that you know he he's such a determined he was such a determined individual, and um, you know, and and I suppose if you want to talk about the time then that that. That he left. What year was it that that, that he left? Two thousand three. Two thousand three. Yeah. I thought it was it was handled poorly by the county board at the time. You know, I mean, you know what he had given to Kerry, and whatever. And you know, it was kind of, it was you know the the, the dirty linen was kind of aired in public, which I kind of felt it should have been handled better. And you know, because that man had given so much to to Kerry, so much to football. And uh, it was it was a pity the way it, it ended. But to, to me, it would never diminish his legacy. Never. Absolutely never, you know. When did you join the panel, Tomas? 97. 97. Um, I wasn't allowed to go. I was doing my leaving cert, but I wasn't allowed to go in until my leaving cert was done. And uh, he used to actually, now I won't say blackmail, but 
he'd kind of plum asked me to get inside the counter and he'd be telling me I'd be bringing you in for a trial now soon enough. But he did, I wasn't allowed in. He was, I thought he was messing, but he did, he brought me in for a trial. And that time it was still the old system, it was Munster Championship and then you only had the semi-final and the final. Um, so I went in in 97, yeah, just after they had won the Munster Championship, yeah. And yourself, Mark and Dara were in there. Well, did you feel... How did you feel that about the fact that he was your uncle managing the team? What did that create? I, I suppose initially when I was young, I did, and I struggled at the very the first game I ever had. I had a poor game with Kerry, and I, you'd learn a lot in that alone. Um, and I was playing corner back against Cork in '98. That was the first game, so um, that didn't that went pear shaped that day for me. But the team won, and on they went to the last second there in the semi final. With Miko, um, but it was never an issue to be quite honest with you, because after that, you knew inside in the training and the and the, the the matches that were going on that you had your position earned. It wasn't as if that you were in yeah. a place where you were struggling or people were questioning anything. It was never ever an issue, but you just made sure that you weren't in a position like that. It was never discussed. I never discussed it with Dara, but like there was a desperate. Um, I think it came from party. Like I would if I missed training. Or if I, I was late to training, or if I was, I get a rap like, you know, it was, it was, you just didn't. There were certain things you didn't do, and Kerry came before everything. So um, there was never, no, I didn't feel under pressure. I don't think maybe Mark the first year. The first year was probably hard, but you were coming in as a young fella. You were coming into yeah, trying to find a seasoned anyway. team like yeah. the team I came into, where I had won the All Ireland the year before. You had the Eamon Breens and the Liam Flaherty's and the Morris Fitzes with fellas like that were that were on the road a long time and you'd learn from that as well like but um no party was was never never spoke about that never spoke about the pressure that you were under in fairness he was always good that way you know did he, he feel pressure doing the job he probably did but if he did he wouldn't leave it out on us like you know he'd soak that up himself he probably did like you know there was desperate why can you tell you the boys would tell you that Kerry is a bad no, he gave that famous quote about animals. Yeah, animals, yeah. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a that's kind in of every club, Paul. Yeah. That's in every county in the country. That you know, not, it's that's not. not just Kerry. It's no. not unique to but Kerry. But there are. Like, you, you lose in Kerry and they'll come with you. And I think that's what killed him in 2003 mm. was the fact that, that the, the idea or the, the, the thoughts were in Kerry that there was a good enough crop of players to be winning all Ireland's, and we didn't give an answer in 2001, we didn't give an answer in 2002, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. And look, Peter Keane felt the same thing three years mm -hmm. without winning. Boom. That's the axe comes it. down like. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't handled well. Do I have an issue with them changing man? No. Should we rode in behind Jack straight away after? There was never an issue. Could they have handled it better the way it came out and the way they went? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just messy. And Kerry would pride themselves in not being messy. So, uh, but 2003, the fact that Tyrone, and you could argue, sure how it took that great Dublin team to actually really beat that yeah. style of football, which was 10 yeah. years later. Mm -hmm. So you were asking, mm -hmm. tactics didn't really come into it. Mm -hmm. And it took years after to nail, like Tyrone weren't the end product at Donegal, where, for example, but they started off a thought process that made managers and coaches think, Jesus, if you don't have a set of players as good, as another set of players, you can set up in a way that we can, mm. you know, bait them like and, and make it way harder for them, you know. So it was, I'd say, at 2003, we didn't really have a, an issue. It was just messy, and it was messy from the... From what what the, did I, I often wonder this, what did, what did Paddy think of Jack O'Connor? I should, he would have had uh, great... I, I remember. As a selector. And then, yeah, I remember, and, and Jack wasn't... Uh, Jack wasn't a great, huge socialiser. Jack would have his few pints. And uh, I remember Jack had a draw for the game as much as, as Paddy did. There were different characters. Um, you know, Jack wouldn't have socialised with the players as much. But I think it was Paddy that brought Jack in first day as a selector. And after one of the All-Irelands, I remember uh, walking across the road to the pub in the morning. And the two of them were inside drinking tea, discussing the game. Um, and they had a couple of pints after that. But um, no, I don't think Paddy had a desperate issue with Jack coming in, taking the position. It was the next step because Jack had been successful with the with the twenty ones in Kerry, but and he would have got on fine with him, you know. But there's always like there's no matter who you talk, depending who you talk to, they might say there's a rift between uh, South Kerry and and West Kerry and this fella and that fella. 
But at the end of the day, and I think it came from people like Dwyer and Paul, he learned from people like Dwyer, mm. Kerry trumped everything. And at the end of the day, that was it. So it didn't matter who was in charge or who was playing or who was not playing as long as Kerry won. Questions are only asked when Kerry are when they lose. And and yeah. Mike, are your group of are your group of players that uh, the lads you you won all mm. of those all Ireland for? Are you close? Uh, do you know, funny, I would be close enough, you know, but wouldn't be living in each other's ears, I suppose. You know, we a lot of us would meet up at golf outings nowadays, you know, but because there would there, be would have been criticism. There, like, how do you mean criticism? Pub, public enough criticism between different parts when different people were managers? Oh, there would be. Uh, well, that's a different. But, but going back to the team and the squad itself, I remember um, doing an interview with with a journalist a number of years ago, and he had interviewed a lot of the Dublin fellas that we would have played against, and he made a very valid point <clears throat> to me. I was one of the last fellas that he interviewed, and he said, "Do you know, having interviewed both both sets of players, he says." The one thing that I could gauge is that the Dublin fellas are far tighter than the air off the field. And they would have been. We would have had clicks in our squad, like, no doubt. Now, they all would have got on well, but, but some clicks would have gone, got on better with other clicks. Yeah, it's a big but county, too, isn't it? It's a huge, it's a huge yeah, but it is. It's, it's a huge county. It is a huge county. <laughs> no, it's a huge county. But the one thing I would say, and I suppose it was part of Miko's greatness, that once we crossed the white line, oh, they all pulled together, like, there was no, there was no clicks on the field. But there would have been clicks, clicks off the field. Like party, party would have had, like you know, you talk about clicks. Like we obviously the Tralee fellas would have hung around together. The North Kerry fellas would have hung around together. No, we would all have socialised together as well at some stage. Like, but there was only one guy that party or uh, that Piche was close to and close, really, really, really tight with Tomas Lodas was Party Lynch, you know. And Party would be kind of, a, nearly you could say, an opposite, a very quiet kind of a fella. Would love to socialise. He'd be great, but himself and Paddy were. Oh my God, they were very. So they got into they trouble. They got into trouble a few <laughs> times. Well, the famous story was before the '78 All Ireland semi final, Saturday Night Fever one. John Travolta. Oh, yeah. We used to have a team meeting at ten o'clock in, in in the Grand Hotel. The team meeting always on the Saturday night was, Nico. Usually the weather was good. I think one night. We, we had to have it indoors. We'd walk down to the beach and make out do his bit of a chat below. Now, there was no tactics board or nothing. It was, it was a touch of Brian Cody, win your own battle, and a few basic things about, you know, giving an early ball or whatever, you know. But, but um, what was the point I was making there? I'm about to lose my Party Lynch. Or Party. Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever. The boys went in anyway. To Saturday Night Fever. And, uh, they claimed that the queue was too long, that, they, that they'd, they'd missed the meeting, so they decided they'd go to the, to the bar for a couple of pints anyway. And God only knows how many pints they had. Now, some people say they had two or three, other people say that they had seven or eight. But I remember talking to Mick O'Dwyer. Mick actually came down on the, on the Sunday night in the train with us, and most of the boys stayed in Dublin. After the game, we played Ross Common, and... I'd say the three best players on the field was our half back line the same day. It was a kind of a damp old squib day. But we played solid enough now and Ross Common were physical enough as well. And well so had we plenty of physical fellas, but you had PO number five, the Harsey centre back and Paddy Lynch left half back. And uh but uh Tim Kennelly, I can remember now, and he wasn't having to drink at the same time, but the boys would say the three of them now, they'd be called like when they went on, on sessions, the rat pack. And I always remember the horse he came in and anyway, you know, and of course he was delighted. We were facing all Ireland final and he came in and Mikko came in the dressing room door after a few minutes later. He says, Mikko, I'll tell you one thing, you'd win nothing without the rat pack, he says, you know, <laughs> the three boys, they were probably the three best players in the field. But going back to the famous Saturday Night Fever thing, the two boys there, anyway, Mikko and Dwyer would said to us, a few of the players quietly, that when the boys arrived back out from Dublin for the team meeting, he said he knew straight away that Paddy Lynch had liquor. But he said he had no idea P. Shea had liquor. No idea. <laughs> but he didn't say a word. But when we went back training, now the two boys were definitely... Can I, can I stop yeah, you there? You Paddy told me what happened, all yeah, right? Yeah. So they went into Dublin. Yeah. From Malahide. From Taxi Malahide. Taxi from Malahide, yeah. So they went to see Saturday Night Fever. What there was a big long it? queue. Yeah. When they got to the door, the man said, full house. <laughs> so they decided they'd walk down the street and buy an ice cream. But before they got to the shop, there was a pub. <laughs> and they arrived out in the Grand Hotel about yeah. 2 o'clock in the morning. And yeah. who was sitting inside? Only Dwyer. Dwyer and he yeah. dropped both of them. Yeah. And Poidy, For an all Ireland semi-final. Yeah. And Poidy was awake all night. He says, I have to be playing in this game. 
what am I going to do to yeah. change this fellow's mind? Yeah. So Mikko used to go to Mass yeah, that was every mass, yeah. Sunday morning with a fellow from South Kerry, Eric Murphy was his name. And Poidy decided he'd go to Mass. And Dwyer went to communion, and Poidy was standing at down at the bottom of the church, and he waited and he waited until everybody was almost finished with communion. And then he walked up. And he was walking down, making sure that Dwyer saw him. And seemingly Dwyer turned to Eric Murphy and he said to him, Look down, John Travolta. But <laughs> 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 well, he never let and the truth. No, he never does so. a good story. No, no yeah. it always is. And, <laughs> and he got playing. It did, it did. <laughs> the, the, the manner, he was a different man though, was he, after he left the Kerry job? Did it, did, it, did, it, did it knock him? Was it a big knock on him? I think it probably, I think it was the way it ended. It wasn't the actual incident and the way it was handled at the very end. I think probably the fact that he had lost against Armagh, he had lost against Meat, he had lost against Throne. Throne. Mm. And I think that, that grated with him because he wanted beyond anything else to be a success with Kerry. And Kerry was number one for him. And the fact that he didn't go out, he wanted another chance. That's why he was disgusted when he, he wanted to, and he did to get back in. he did a famous one finger at the press yeah, conference. Yeah, that he wanted he another one, year. One year. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think that's what, what it at him. And I'd say the fact that there was closure on that then, I'd say it was hard on him. Like, And um, I remember he did. He got, he got upset with us one day and he said, I couldn't manage anybody else. I wouldn't have the stomach for it. Two weeks later, he was above over West Meath. 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 Like that was, you know, so yeah. there was, yeah. there was that part of it. He recovered, but I think that journey with West Meath lifted him. Mm. Uh, but uh, there was like, no, they won the Leinster Championship, but and, and I, I don't know what in my gut. I don't think he wanted to meet Kerry. I don't know. Mm. Was that his? Mm. Obviously, he'd come up himself after that and and approach that whatever way he had to. But I'd say it suited him to have. The Leinster Championship pushed it with, with Westmead, which was historic. But then I think, I think we were next, and I think Derry had, had, had beat Westmead after that, and we played Derry then after that. So it mm. would have been, I'd say that would have been difficult. Because the system had just changed, hadn't it? Where yeah, the backdoor system. Oh, yeah, yeah. And into yeah. That. And yeah, yeah. I think it was his greatest achievement in, in management yeah. terms to win the Leinster Championship with Westmead. Mm. Mm. Like many people have won all mm. Ireland's with Kerry, mm -hmm. nobody else has won the Leicester Championship with mm. with Mead. And you were there for that, mm. Tomas. What was that like? I suppose uh, the way it started really was you know, he was approached by somebody mm. from from West Mead, and he, he he signed up with them anyway. All right, and then he he came to Dublin. One day he asked me to meet him. Uh, he was at a Fault Ireland meeting. And he asked me, would I go down on Saturday night to Westmead with him to pick a few selectors? And she said, I don't know how to pick a selector. What do you do? So anyway, we went to the event down. It was a charity event run by Goal. And I was at the table down there, and he was asking some fella to be a selector with him. And he said no, and Paddy was disgusted with this. You know, how could a fella say no to a man with eight All-Island medals? And Paddy Shea. So anyway... Somebody, I think it was Joe Connolly was actually at the table and he was, he was asking the me, Holler. yeah, he was asking me, why don't you go in a selector with him? And sure, I said, you have no, no idea yeah. how, to, how to work with an inter-county team. But anyway, a few days later, I got a call from Poidy and he asked me, Jesus, will you become a selector? You can train the team, I'll give you full run of how to everything, he said. So... I was saying, Jesus, Polly, I wouldn't have time to go down. I'm really busy with work, and sure, I wouldn't be in time for... You were living in Dublin. You were living in Dublin at this stage, yeah. So he was at me for about a week, and I was saying no to him. Really, I was afraid to ask them in the bank for permission because I'd have to go off early. Until Dara rang me one night, and Dara said to me in the end, look, I don't care what you do, he says, but all, I, all I'd say to you is, if you go with him... Mm you'll have two of the best years ever. And that, and that was, yeah, it. That was it, I yeah. went into my boss the following day, it was agreed, he let me off every evening to go off training with, uh, or train the team or whatever. And that's how it started. And 
I'm sure he was always full of ideas. Like the first thing, <clears throat> first time we met the team, we played a game in Dublin. Uh, we let Jack Cooney and Paddy Collins pick the team that day. And we met the team in the City West Hotel. We had never seen them before. We played the dubs. And myself and Poidy sat on the bench that day. Poidy was wearing this, like an, an undertaker's coat, a big, long navy coat. And Jesus Westmeath, they were, you know, the word that's, that comes out, they're useless. That's know, how yeah, bad yeah. they were now yeah, that day. Yeah, yeah. And Poidy turned to me at one stage and he says, Jesus, what did we leave ourselves in here for? <laughs> And oh, it was, they were terrible. But then he got on to Mick McCarthy, the Irish football manager. He was with Sunderland at the time. And we went over to Sunderland the following weekend for a training session. And then we came back and he got these loads, tons of sand to put down on the side of the pitch to train. And we spent the winter training in that. Oh my God, it was ferocious. But, um, the way that he wanted to operate the whole thing was that he wanted me to, to do all the physical work with him. And the, re, the, the way he said it was, what I want you to do is, I don't give a fiddlers about the National League, he said, but have them ready for the championship for me. So you work on everything below the neck. And when you have them right for me, then I'll work on everything <laughs> above the neck. Well, That's basically the way it happened. But he was, a, he, was a, he was a folk hero almost immediately in Westmead, even from the Auburn Cup. Oh, the crowd was, I remember Mullingar, 10,000 people having a Bourne Cup match in, it must have been January. Yeah, he was very enthusiastic at the beginning. Um, he had loads of ideas and um, the first game that we had, um, and, and again then he was very Peshogach, like before the first uh, Auburn Cup game, we went for a walk, the two of us that morning, we stayed in a hotel up there and we went for a walk in the morning and we saw the scout a black and white coat. Poddy had never seen a black and white coat before. So we went to the game and the place was thronged and they all had come to see Poddy, of course. Anyway, we won the game following Saturday or Sunday morning. What do we do this morning, Poddy? Jesus, we better go and see that coat again. I think he's a lucky yeah. charm. And every day after that, we had to do the same thing. Go and see the goat first and he'd be inside and like the crowd would be watching him walking up and down the sideline. And there was one day he had this big padded jacket on. And next thing he threw it off. And the crowd went wild. And he sat down <laughs> on the bench and he says, Jesus, I thought I had left all this mayhem behind me and Kerry. And everything was going grand then. And we started the National League. But then something happened. He's, he was missing from a few sessions and stuff like that. And I think... What happened was, and Tomás touched on it a minute ago, it was Kerry. We were going to be playing Kerry in the, in the National League. He was playing now, mm. or he was managing now against the team that it was his team, yeah. really. And the players were his players, and he couldn't face it. He just sat on the bench that day. He asked me to take charge that day. And that I think that really got to him because he started going missing for a few training sessions after that. And it really, really hurt him that he couldn't be with Kerry. And it was only then, when the league was finished, we won our last National League game. And it was only then, a few weeks later, the whole thing changed again. He arrived, he went out on the pitch, he was tugged out. He was out in a pair of shots, tugs, taking frees and stuff. And the whole thing changed then again. Yeah. But like he was, <clears throat> again, going back to the ideas and Tomás touched on it before as well, the relationship he had with players. He was, he was great getting to know players and um, instilling belief in them. And the way that he did that, like he brought them away to Inchidani before the first championship game. Um, and then he, he went and he was always talking to them about being steely tough. And then he went to the Canon the Hofianacht in Dingle who was an Irish scholar, and he asked him to get a word for him and get a phrase maybe for him about, so that he could say it to Westmead lads about being steely tough. And the canon came back to him and he gave him a thing, and then with that, so it, that means 
hitting an oak tree with your fist. And then he went to be on the stack jeweler in Dingle, and he got this small piece of silver, and those words were inscribed in it. And he brought the team away then to oh Ross's Point one weekend, and he told them, he told them that he had um, uh, a, a gift for them, and he was going to make a presentation. But he built it all up. He started telling a story about his first All Ireland final in 1975 that he was based in the Temple Moor. And the plan was that the team would come to Dublin by train and they would stop in Temple Moor and there would be a big fanfare for him from the guards going off on the train. But he didn't want this at all. And it was playing at him, he said. And he. He went to the boss and he told him, look, I'm not happy at all with this. When I'm going to Croke Park the next day, I want to be leaving from my own home inventory. And when I pull that door after me, the last face I want to see is my mother's face. Now, it was fairly powerful and he was only warming them up to this stage now. And then he told them about what that means. And he said to them, you know, these teams in Leinster now, Offaly, Dublin, Meath. When Westmeath came up against those guys before, when they got hit, the Westmeath guys folded. And then he explained that what this means is when you are hitting a Westmeath man the next day in Croke Park, it's like hitting your fist off an oak tree. They bounce off you. You're so strong now, you're physically mm -hmm. fit. And he put that belief into their head. And they felt that they were way stronger already. Mm -hmm. That's the way, I think that's what he did for them. They didn't have that belief before. He gave them a bit of direction. Uh, he instilled belief in them. And basically he was telling them that they were way better than they had actually thought. And, and got to a Leinster final against Leash and in 2004. And in that match, Leash being trained by Mick O'Dwyer, which makes it all the more interesting. And have the game won, really, with a few minutes left, three points up, clearly the better team, and fold in the last few minutes, and it ends up a draw. What, what, what did he do after that to prepare Westmead for, for, for the next day? When we, when we went into the dressing room, uh, I know that the Leash were very happy, um, and Dwyer was really Cock a hoop smiling. afterwards. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the Westmead lads went into the dressing room, they had the, head, the heads down, they were really disappointed with them, themselves. And no, no talk in the dressing room. The next thing, your man comes in and he eats them. Looking when it goes through them, he said, what the hell are you like that for? Basically, he told them that, look, you did really well today um, for 65 minutes. We have to do it for 70 minutes next weekend. We are going to do it for 70, 70 minutes, and we're going to have the cup going home with us. And he changed the mood in the dressing room straight away. And it was all on to next week then. And you didn't train that week? Well, the, the routine was that after the game, we'd go to a swimming pool, and then we'd go out to the Port Marrick Hotel for a meal, and we'd talk to them. I'd tell them what we do in training, and party would work again for everything above the neck. Mm. And that week when we went in uh, training, we, after all the grueling training that we had done during the winter, uh, we told them then that nobody is allowed to run in training this week. And it was all about the talking and letting the body mm. recover and being fresh again for next weekend. And, you obviously saw the clip on YouTube about the grain of the rice, grain of rice yeah. and all of that. You know, that's what he was doing that week. Yeah. And he had them prepped again for next weekend. And, you know, they came home with the cup. And, the and after that, one thing I remember from that night, you know, himself and Dwyer, you know, they were always, he says, Jesus, I can't get away from this fella anywhere all through my life. This fella, I, he's always there. But that night, I remember him saying, Jesus, finally, I got one over that fucker. <laughs> <laughs> but did it, mean, did it mean, like, what did it mean to him, though, to win with Westmead? Like, did he, was the, the Kerry was never really let go. Um, no, Kerry never let go. And 
I don't know if it really sunk in with him what he had achieved with them. There were, at the time, there was Westmead, Wicklow, Ferman, and I think there was another county, and they had never actually won anything at senior football level. Yeah, no provincial title. So, yeah. so Westmead mm -hmm. had won at this mm -hmm. time, and Paddy was the man that that did it for them, really. And I, I don't know if he ever. His, his, his mind was always in Kerry, even, even those times when we went into Croke Park in the bag, and he used to show it to me. He had a teddy bear in his bag all the time, a lucky charm. But the teddy bear, even though we were with Westmead now, the teddy bear was dressed in green and gold. Kerry football. And I don't think he could ever get away from that. Um, even when we'd be going into Croke Park on the bus coming from Malahide, I'd be sitting beside him and he'd ask me, how are you feeling? I said, I'm fine, Paddy. He said to me, jeez, do you ever get excited? I can do with bicycle clips now. <laughs> and then we'd go into Croke Park, we'd be driving in and he'd see the roof and he'd, you know, you'd see the shoulders yeah. moving straight away and he'd say, Jesus, I love this place. I met my best when I'm in here. And I as you know, as yeah. you know, Paul, come on as well, he was at his best in there. Oh, he was. In Crow Park. Yeah. He was, yeah. He was so comfortable in there. Um, he, knew, he knew that things worked for him in there. But the Kerry thing, it was only, I think, it was only, I left the bank in 2012, and I rang Paddy, and I said to him, Paddy, um, we'll have to go and celebrate it. And he said, come down to Dingle and we'll go out. And it was in November 2012. And Jesus had a great day with him. Yeah. We had, he was drinking pots of tea. And he was, he was talking about Westmead and, you know, how did we get that out of them? I thought it was only then that he had realized what he had done. And he had some great stories about it. And he was telling Jesus, I'm telling the story now against myself, but you know, when things are tough at home with Tomas and Dara, or maybe they'd have a bad game or something like that, I try and lift the mood and I tell them the story about our game against Offaly in Croke Park. He always had a trouble. He had two problems in Westmead. He he couldn't recognize that. He, he could never rec remember their name and he couldn't recognize them. He thought they all, he thought they all looked the same. Jesus, the Kerry fell, fellas. <laughs> they, you could, it's very easy to, uh, to, to recognize them. These fellas, they all look the same. <laughs> but anyway, we came in after the first game and he, uh, after the after half time against Offaly and he had this habit when we came in in the middle of the summer that the boys would take off their tops, they're sweating, he'd get a towel and he'd be rubbing them down and he'd be yeah, yeah. talking to them. And he was talking to this fella. Right. Man, that's what's... And I went over to him and he was telling him, stay back, you're doing fine, don't be going <laughs> forward, stay back, stay back. And I tapped him on the shoulder and you said to me, he says, <coughs> you said to me, Foydy, He's not playing at all. He's one of the subs. He was Russell Casey. And he'd be telling the boys the story to get them going again. <laughs> did, did, did you meet up uh, in those after Polly finished with Westmead? Would you, would you meet him regularly or would you? Not regularly, but if he was in town, no. When I, I, was, I had an office in Dinny Street in the latter years, um, and, and Dara was just down the road, Dara O'Shea working with auctioneering, we'd often meet him for a cup of tea, but we not often enough, you know, because I, I, I you know, you'd love, lo, lo, love his company, but going back to one other thing, as regards Pishogi, inside in the dressing room, like, he was probably the manager, really, at the time, <laughs> he should have been, but he was thinking ahead, but he had this thing in his head, before every big game, he actually would have to do it, just before Mikko said his few words, he'd come over, myself and uh, John Egan, the great John Egan, he called the two of us, you no, know, he thought we were the only two players who might might go for goal. And he had this thing in his head, like, and he, he did it before every big game. And he said, lads, look, early in the game, if you get a chance of a goal, take the point. He had this thing in his head, like, if the goalie saves it, he said, you're going to give those fellas energy. 
take the point and you kind of vegan okay. myself and look but he'd do it before every game and that was you know but he was thinking like a yeah, manager thinking, yeah you know he was thinking your game he as well he would no <laughs> he gonna say to me you should get a chance of going to go for it he'd be completely wired up yeah, you, right, when he was playing he was completely he wired would, up he, would, he, he was would. saying that he they were playing in North Island semi-final in Dublin one day and he has come down out um, the dressing room was between the canal and the Hogan yeah. at that stage and he, yeah. he has come out in a tunnel yeah, yeah. And he was the first man out with the ball anyway, and he was hopping coming out, and he was just ready to get onto the field, and the gate was locked, and he yeah. couldn't open it. Yeah. And he said he was going mad, trying yeah. to get out, yeah. uh, playing the dubs. Mm. And John Egan, sorry, he got a tap on the shoulder, <laughs> and he looked around, and it was John, John. Egan, and he says, Poity, um, if I don't see you afterwards, I'll meet you in the cat and cage. <laughs> and here he said, Jesus, I'm trying to break down the, the gate. And this fella, of all the fellas yeah. that was going to destroy the dubs, yeah. here he was, <coughs> to go to the cat and cage. Yeah, it was another, another day. I'd say, I think it was 1979, like he'd be hyper, like, and we're playing Dublin anyway. And um, Mick was just about to say his few words, so we were all in the doing our going into the loop. Next day I was inside the Jacks and when I came back out, and after being inside the jacks for three or four times, the next thing anyway, well, I heard this roaring. And I said, Jimmy, I thought, Mick, I, Mick, I'd started. But you just passed the, the old dressing rooms, the showers were on the left after coming out of the loop. <laughs> next thing, Tommy Dale and Paddy inside. Paddy had him cut by the throat, right? And two wishes now. And Tommy Dale had a stare in his eyes, I'm telling you. And I, I'm passing here and I'm stopping looking at it. And Paddy was sent in. Private, like, because Tommy Dyle was in the army and that was his nickname. Private, you're marking the dirtiest player on the Dublin team today. Yes, P.O., yes, P.O. He said, when you get near him before the game, he says, catch him, by the you know what? And don't let go till you hear a crack. Right, P.O., right, P.O. I went back into the loo again. I said, what, the Dublin will have seen Oh, that's so funny. They were just completely hyped. Completely, you know? completely. Oh, my God. I, 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 over the last couple of weeks, I spent a lot of time looking at interviews and reading interviews and reading with Donald Keenan's book and, and other bits and pieces with him. I, I, I think I, I met Paddy briefly in the pub once, never didn't speak to him, was hello, two sentences, nothing else. I, I think he's a very complicated man. Would you disagree with that? I'm complicated enough myself to understand <laughs> that, that I couldn't make that call on somebody else. Yeah. I don't know, I think he had. Complicated, mm. I suppose. Look, he was driven. Uh, mm. I think every everybody who has the success, I suppose, that he's had and the life that he had, I suppose, could you just? I think you can describe everybody as complicated. Yeah, yeah difficulties mm. like everybody else. You know, there was there was no there was no doubt about that. But I uh, I mean, I wouldn't no more in a fascinating in that whole interest in he is. Yeah, I think. Look, he was always interesting, and I think he he as life went on and. I think there was two switch when he was switched on he was driven and then he used to enjoy himself and relax and I think people had that I have that mixture of him when he was the Kerry side of him and then there's his own personal character which I think rubbed off on everybody you know the stories that people still talk about and you go in anywhere and you tell 10,000 body stories and that, that mm. fun um, yeah, he probably was like, but sure, aren't we all like? You know, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. You know, I, mm. I I do firmly believe we we um, you'd miss him around the place. That'd be the one thing. Like he is, mm. I think it's like no. I remember, you know, anybody that that you know, we all go through it. Somebody dies, the whole dynamic changes, but the place behind is completely different. You know, the the bar is different. Everything is different. You know, there's you miss the 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 character. You miss the welcome. You miss. The, the the fun and the banter and the trips in the car and all that crack you know it was um, you know he he fitted so much into his own life when he was around the place um, but everything you know anytime you remember him now it is with fun you know it was like I remember um, Tom was saying there that he wanted to leave the the county from instead of leaving from from the guards above that he wanted to go from home. I remember in 2009, we were lucky enough to be Cork in an All-Ireland final and um, I was under pressure. I had to get home fast. And Dara, these are the two lads that, that just woke me around. Mm -hmm. Dara, after the game, uh, I says, I met Dara outside the palace and then Dara says to me, he says, where are you going next? And this was just after the match and the rest of the lads were on the bus gone to the hotel, I'd say. 
But uh, I says I'm heading home. I'm heading. I'm heading to Cork. I'm going home. And uh, he says to me, "Geez, I think, of course, very light party." He says, "I think you're after winning man of the match. You'd have to be up for that." Do you know what's on? Mm. I didn't get man of the match at all. Like, but <laughs> he just wanted me around the place. So yeah. I stayed up. So the following morning, when I wake up, I was definitely going to Cork. Definitely. So the lads all got on the bus to go for the train station. So I kind of said I'd work my way up through the town and get up to the train station. I wasn't too much of a rush as long as I got home. Mm. But the last station before the the last bar before the the train station for West Kerry people is the Merchant. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. It was about two or three o'clock that I landed into the Merchant. And who was inside around the table of about 20 fellas and a sing song going on on a party. So I sat down, I had a couple of drinks with them. And James Begley, the musician, and John Martin, the driver, was with him. Uh, his, his famous driver who could write a book himself, to be quite honest about it. <laughs> to be mm, best I can writer. imagine. But he mm. said, I said to him, after a while, he says, where are you going? And I says, I'm going down on the train, I'm going to Cork. And he says, no way. He says, no way you carry your own medal. Uh, to Cork and carry your own medal home, go home. Didn't take much convincing me to jump into the car and we had a trip down, which was very funny. The, he stayed off the motorway and we drove down the back roads and we were coming down through Tipperary and as we were driving past this bar, he mm. says, pull in there, he says, pull in. But I noticed it straight away, I was in the back seat with James Begley and I noticed three BBC vans. I just, it's very strange in the middle of Tipperary yeah, to have yeah. three BBC vans mm. in the <laughs> car park. So in we went, and I copped it straight away. There was lights down the corner, and it was uh, an interview with Shane McGowan below the corner. Mm -hmm. And um, I talk about Polly, who his ego. Polly thought the whole world knew who he was, and, mm -hmm. and in a fun way, in a light yeah. way. So yeah, I yeah, could see yeah. this. Uh, but your man was being interviewed. He saw James Begley, the musician, and he jumped up when he saw Begley. Mm -hmm. McGowan did. And yeah. you could see the boys in the camera, oh, Jesus Christ. So he went up and he met James, a big hug. And I could see, I was watching Potty, I could see Potty yeah. expecting yeah. Shane McGowan to no. say, Hi, Potty, how are you? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I wasn't coming. So I was kind of smirking yeah. at this and it was yeah. just going on 20, 30 seconds. And the next thing Potty said he'd take it. And, uh, Shane, maybe, maybe he didn't see me. Yeah. Shane, Potty, Shane, how are you? And your man totally blanked him. Yeah. <laughs> there was half a pint yeah. left. Yeah. And Paddy turned to me, we're over that, we're leaving here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we ended oh, up in Inch that night yeah. singing songs oh, yeah. and uh, we brought, oh, the, we brought the medal home. Yeah. Brilliant. There was no the, but, uh, he started that, that Monday, sorry Thomas, he started that Monday Boar's Head tradition of teams going there on the Monday after mm. finals. I think yeah, it was Paddy who started right, that. Yeah. I, I worked in, um, I worked in the AB in Capel Street. And uh, Jesus, during the day sometimes, I'd get a phone call from Paddy. He says, um, come down to my office. And I had to go down to put the board set to him. But carrying on to what you said there, um, after, you know, when Paddy used to go up to watch the boys play in, in games in Croke Park, on the Monday he used to go to the board's head. And obviously he used to call the lads in, Tomas and Darren, Mark, and they'd be in. And that's how that tradition started. And he told, he told Hugh that you are nothing until I put you on the map. Um, and that's how everybody goes to the board said now on, on Monday afternoon. Yeah, he was his first Ireland's. customer in 1994, he told me. First, first man in the door. First man oh, yeah. yeah. Didn't, know, didn't know him. Yeah. 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 Mm. But the other thing, you know, mm. Jesus, the speeches he was given the dressing rooms with the Westmeat lads. Um, uh, uh, there'd be lads, uh, you know, county board officials in there. And, uh, they used to have tears coming down their face with uh, emotion. And I'd be, I'm only wondering now, like, what it was, if he was able to do that with Westmead, what, what, what was it like when they'd be green and gold jerseys around him and yeah, well, down the like? parky mm -hmm. Oh, it was, look, sure, it was very, I'd say, very mm -hmm. like, I'd say what Paul used to bring mm -hmm. with him was what he saw with the wire yeah. and that passion. And I'd say he learned to pile for he had to learn, and his own I personality did. came out in it. But he was completely, you know, he was just driven going into places, and you could see him, he was so tuned in. Um, there was nobody more tuned in than him when, when, when we'd land in. Like, I used to love going to Parky Creeve with him because in Parky Creeve, the old Parky Creeve, you know, they're a fantastic mm -hmm. stadium, but the old Parky Creeve, the dressing rooms were the tiniest dressing rooms for the for the visiting teams that you'd ever come across. Literally, you wouldn't fit ten grown men inside them, and there was thirty of us inside them. And um, I remember you'd have to come out and you'd have to come through the the tunnel where all the people were, so they'd stop the people and they'd make the gap, and then yeah. the, the the players would come out. It was a brilliant 
pitch to play in, but he was. He was always tuned in. The weeks before, it, it was always the week of the game that he would really tune in and the, that that he'd give chats on the on the on the field inside in the dressing room. Um, but he was. He was as passionate. So that's the. Mm. He was and, sharp, like he was a way more clever yeah. and a way more intelligent than people gave him credit Absolutely. for. Yeah, I think that's what I meant when I asked you about mm. it being complicated because. There's that image, there's the mm. image that he portrayed, and then there's obviously this whole depth behind him yeah. of, of things that he was involved in. Like, we haven't talked mm. about politics. Mm. Uh, about, uh, he was very clever in how to work. Even, like, with Westmeath, it's a funny story, I don't know, should I say it, but mm. he, was a, he was so way clued in. Like in terms of working, he would come down and he would write letters, personal letters to people, and he knew how to ask the right questions, who to talk to, he mm. would mingle with the right people all the time and he would be fun, he knew his place, he knew exactly what he was doing and he could lean on fellas then for advice and all that. I remember um, Frank Murphy and we're in, in Cork at the moment and a great GA man and has done all of us Kerry fellas favours down the years um, in terms of advice and in terms of everything else but I know with Westmeat a big bugbear by the GA at the time was that you couldn't encroach the pitch. And yeah. there was a, a rule brought in, so there was some guy above in the stadium, and they were looking down. And if you crossed the pitch, you would pick up a suspension or a match suspension yeah, or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. But I think um, he picked up a suspension anyway, and he went to Frank, and he said, Frank, look, this is ridiculous. I came onto the pitch here, and you sorted out for me. And Paddy's suspension, initial suspension was cut out. But when Paddy would go on holidays, and the lads went on a great trip to South Africa, Paddy would tail away on his own, and... I heard Michal O'Shea, the radio commentator, uh, saying that you'd get a, a postcard and he'd make sure it was the most <laughs> embarrassing postcard that you would get into the post. Yeah. But after that, he went and he got a postcard and he sent it to Frank Murphy. And what the postcard was, was a picture of a lady on a tennis court and she was topless and it was over the line. And he put on the back, he called Frank Prince Cheese. He says, yes. Prince Cheese, they wouldn't do this girl for crossing the line. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all he was oh, saying. Yeah, yeah. But he, you know, yeah. would always yeah. kind of make sure it was very embarrassing. I'd say T shucks of the day used to get the most embarrassing yeah. postcard. Yeah. Well, I, I used, get, I used, I used to get yeah, them in the no, bank, no. and uh, most of the managers working with me, they were all women. And I'd get, come uh, on, come on, there's a card yeah. here for you. <laughs> Which is funny, Paul, you're talking about the compassionate side of him as well. My father died in 2004. You were out in Lanzarote in a training camp, I'd say, weren't you, in January? And uh, Pio was at the funeral anyway, and he was buried on the Monday or the Tuesday. And next thing, on the Thursday, my mother got this most beautiful letter written from Paddy. You know, his handwriting was worse than mine, but the letter, the contents of it were absolutely unbelievable. And it made such a difference to my mother that he would actually, you know, he had been at the funeral and this arrived in and the doors there, like addressed personally to her, you know, and about my father. It was such a nice touch, yeah. Yeah, that's something that, oh, that would, incredible, yeah. that, that would live, live true. I wanted to talk as well about, about uh, tickets. He was a great man for tickets, but we're going to leave that. Um, we're going to leave those things. Mikey, I want to leave the yeah. last word uh, yeah. to you. We started with the footballer. I want to finish yeah. with the footballer. Is there a game that stands out for you that Paddy played in that you think is a kind of a, an iconic statement of what he was like? Or is there a particular match? Or is it more of a run of games? Jeez, I'd say a run of games. But one of the games that he was outstanding in, would you believe it, was the 1982 final against the... Yeah, it was brilliant that day. It was outstanding. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, and I felt for him that day, and for John Egan, who had a brilliant game as well, and who was the captain of the team, and who would have been the would have been the best captain we've ever had to lead us to to five in a row. But Paddy was incredible. I think he kicked two points from wing back yeah. the same day, and was outstanding. And but as I said, Paul, you could pick a load of games. I don't think I don't think there was ever any game. And I mean, your statistic initially. That there was only one one kicked off him in how many All Ireland finals? Ten All Ireland, ten or like, eleven I mean, All Ireland finals. That, that's absolutely incredible. But there's no, you know, sometimes <clears throat> you'd say, "Oh my God, such a fellow was poor." I don't think there's ever any game that I could look back on that I played with him and said that party had a stinker. I don't think he ever had. Uh, we could do this as a mini series. Um, it might, I, although we couldn't really, because it's amazing how many people have told me stories in the last two weeks. 
Now, I can't really tell you, you can't really use this one, but yeah. like there's, there's a world of um, <laughs> anecdotes around Paddy that, that, that kind of, I suppose, give you a way into his life. I think one other, sorry, one other thing before you finish, Paul, is, um, you know, when he, when he used to be giving the speeches, uh, 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 you know, before a game or whatever, and he'd be on full flow, and next thing he'd stop, the, the word wouldn't come out in English. And he'd bring it out in Irish. He'd say it in Irish. And I think that's one thing with Paddy as well. You know, when he took over the bar in Cruger's, that he got really fond of the Irish language. He was listening to people from the Blasket Islands. I was going to say, is, is that the group of people who were from the Blasket originally? Yeah, were like the likes of Shining Vickle and Foyley and uh, Sean Fats Tam and all those. And Paddy was a great storyteller. And I think he picked it up because they were great storytellers and they had fantastic Irish and he learned a lot of Irish from them, the bloss and the storytelling aspect of it and you know when he'd go to Dublin and meet these film stars and politicians he'd be telling them stories about these lads from Don Queen and uh, I think that was a big part of everything for him as well because when he was drawing people to to Count Thra or to West Kerry with the football tournaments and uh, bringing tourists to the place, he was able to, he, he was interested in the heritage of the place and the history of the place. And I think that was a big part of him as well. Yes. And, and he changed his name, the spelling of his name in the mid 80s. I saw that because if you look at the original programs, it was P-A-U-D-I-E mm. and O'Shea spelt Anglicized mm. way. Yeah. And then it was yeah. it changed really yeah. in the middle of it. Yeah, I, I never heard that discussed, but I know he did. Yeah. And my mother actually did the same. She re she she rang the newspapers and told them that they were spelling Dara's name wrong as well. <laughs> <laughs> Which was strange, yeah, because it was spelled D A R A. Oh, yeah, Canada yeah. was spelled that way, but yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember old programs because my grandmother used to keep all the old programs and all. Like Paddy was the 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 king in the house, and she used to have a room above in her own house. Full, I mean, top wardrobes full, bed, everything. The room was full, and you go up, and I used to love reading the the old clips of, of matches and big games, and the build up to the All Ireland mm. Finals was nearly more interesting. The the the, the report yeah. after you'd have the pictures. I used to love looking at the pictures and the footage of training or, training, or, yeah. or pictures inside with the boys. Um, but yeah, that was there as well. Yeah. Do you think um, so? You're what, what one of four brothers. Which he was most like, Paddy? Jesus, hopefully no one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like Dara is a great character. You know, you always have a laugh. Well, there's probably bits in everybody. You know, because yeah. Mikey said something there. There was a part of him that was soft. There was a part of him that was conscientious. Yeah. There was a part of him um, that would think of something that no.